thank you, everybody. I think we should start. It's my honor to present our third invited speaker, Ariane Nabit Halb. And uh, she uh, started in research after her PhD in computer science and signal processing uh, at Telecom uh, Paris Tech. She went over to research, uh, uh, for example, at ATR uh, in Japan, and then moved to speech uh, technology industry, Interalia in uh, uh, NANS uh, communication. And uh, she has worked with uh, uh, offering a speech to different communities uh, from uh, uh, industry to uh, state agency, academia, and so on. Actually, she is the leader of the speech and conversational AI time, uh, team at By Dialogue. And uh, she is at the same time uh, a European uh, uh, community expert and uh, a board member of the language te technology invite in Novat. And uh, her long uh, title is 100 Years of Speech Recognition, the Data Fork and the Conversational Challenge, Stories from Today's Speech Industry. This is very interesting for our community of researchers. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so we get a long title here. Um, so I'll try to, to go through all these topics and, and hopefully you'll see how they're related together. Um, so first, I, I'll start with a very brief introduction maybe of uh, well, who am I has been, has been explained already, maybe who is my company. So uh, Vadalag is, is busy in the um, customer relationship management um, business. So typically it's a, it's a telco operator and we're handling agent customer interactions as well as customer bots interactions. Okay, so now first topic, we're now uh, celebrating 100 years of speech recognition. How is that possible? Well, if you look at the first toy, which was speech activated, it was the Radio Rex toy, which was commercialized in the US in 1920. Okay, and then ooh, fast forward 2020 or 2018, whatever, and you got Google Duplex uh, suggesting to take an appointment for you. Hey, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Okay, so you, you heard the second uh, speaker. Actually, the second speaker was Google Duplex. So uh, calling to, uh, to take an appointment for, uh, for her client. Uh, so how did we move from, to, from Radio Rex to Google Duplex? Okay, that's the first topic we'll be, we'll be reviewing. Okay, so first of all, Radio Rex was uh, at that time, of course, analog an expert, we'll see how it works. Um, then in the 60s, we moved to digital and expert systems. Then in the 80s, statistical and hybrid, we'll see the details. And I've put the, the, the photograph of Fred Jelinek because it's, it sounded appropriate here to, to, <laughs> to show this picture. Well, we're, we're in Prague, okay, so he's from Czech origin. I know there is some grudge between the linguistic community and Fred Jelinek because he's supposed to have said something like, each time I fire a linguist from my team, my system gets uh, one point higher performance. Okay, so the linguistic community was not very happy about their statement, but but really, uh, what he was trying to say that it was it was a transition. It was really transitioning from expert system based on linguistic knowledge to a statistical system based on machine learning and, and data. Um, then, for a very 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 long time, the statistical hybrid system stayed almost unchanged and like ruled the world of speech recognition until. 2012, when deep learning came up. So I put another photograph, the one from Joshua Benjiu, who got the Turing uh, Prize uh, with uh, Jan Lequin and Geoff Hinton, so the kind of Nobel Prize for computer science uh, for introducing deep learning. And he was specifically busy with 
speech recognition. And then it's it it then uh, at, at very fast pace you have new uh, new architectures uh, happening like you move from just deep learning to end to end and then end to end self supervised and we'll see what's uh, what it really means and probably those each of those points in time are a little revolution and and I'm going to show you why. Okay, so the first one we said Rex, Radio Rex was analog. Okay, so the idea is that you just would shout Rex, and if you had the right pitch, it would uh, make the uh, spring, in, internal spring to resonate, and then, wow, Radio Rex would go out of the kennel. That's how it worked. Very simple, and based on the fact that we know what is the uh, uh, frequency of A in Rex. Okay, simple and efficient. Um, then, uh, in the 60s, when audio could be digitized, uh, we could move to, to something more uh, gener generic, um, looking at the, uh, the spectrogram, so that's what you, you can see on screen. Uh, so, the, the analysis of the audio signal in terms of frequency that are present, uh, sound frequencies that are present in the, in the sound, in the speech signal. And looking at the frequency, you can tell a lot of things. Okay, is that a consonance? Is that a vowel? Uh, what kind is, is that a plosive consonance? Uh, uh, what kind of vowel is it uh, based on the on the format, on the on the uh, kind of frequencies that are present, etc. And so you have people who are able to read spectrograms. So they look at the spectrogram and they tell you, oh, this is uh, bad, bad food. They, they, they can read it. So if they can read it, then they can write the rules. How do they read it? Okay, and so those are expert systems that are able to read spectrogram, and that's the next generation, or that was the next generation of speech recognition. It was not that bad, better than Rex, it would recognize a lot more words, but still it never exceeded like the 70% accuracy on, uh, on more than 10, uh, 10 words lexicon, or 100 word lexicon. So the next revolution then was the Fred Jelinek revolution, so moving to statistical modelization, statistical models. Uh, so you would use an acoustic model, a language model. So the acoustic model was here to, mo to, uh, to model um, how each phoneme of the language is, is being realized. What, what's the sound? What's the typical sounds or sound um, distribution for that phoneme? And then on the other hand, you would have a language model that would model the, the likelihood of a sequence of words. And you put together the two likelihood, and beautifully enough, that, that, makes, that helps you that, uh, um, decide which sequence of words is the most likely given a, uh, an input sound, okay? And so for years and years, so for almost, uh, well, for more than 20 years, it worked quite well and nothing was better than that. Of course, there were tweaks. We, we uh, improved this and that in the acoustic model and the language model, but globally it was the same idea. And uh, we would use Gaussian mixture model, GMM, to model the acoustic model, how a phoneme gives rise to a sound. Okay, and then in 2012, the big revolution was, oh, you just uh, take the GMM out and you put DNA in. Oh, wow, that, that seems like a small change. Why do you call that a revolution? But it was a revolution because the, uh, uh, the accuracy the, uh, on, on all the benchmark was clearly better with, with DNA and it was just such a small change. So, so the reason it worked is that DNA was able to do more than just model the acoustic distribution of uh, phonemes, okay? So that's why we move to end-to-end. -end. So end-to-end -end is the idea to use the DNN, the deep neural network, not only to, uh, to model the probability of uh, uh, this phoneme to give rise to that sound, but to, to do the full decoding. Okay, give me give me the speech input, and I'll give you the uh, the, uh, the the sequence of characters that that is related to that speech input, and it worked quite well. And actually, in benchmarks, you, uh, if you had enough data, you would actually be better than the uh, the all the previous systems, even with DNN but hybrid ones. Uh, but the problem is that you needed a lot of data to train, 
So the next revolution then is this one, self-supervised learning. And I think it's, it's something very important for this community here because we're talking about um, language resources, annotation, et cetera. So this is major because self-supervised learning means that there is part of the model, what we call the pre-trained model or the foundation model that you can train without any annotation. You just take raw data. So you can take huge volume of data, okay? And you just learn from that raw data. You learn things, okay? Um, what do speech sounds sound like? I don't, I, I, don't, I don't need to know whether it's a vowel, a consonant, an A or R. I just want to learn um, structure, something about the, the, the speech sound, human, human speech sound. And that actually works. So you pre-train a model, learn something about the audio, and then you, you will just fine tune it on a specific task. Okay, I want to do speech recognition. I want to do emotion recognition. I want to do gender recognition, whatever task you decide. And you're training on a small data set, a very carefully annotated data set. And it works beautifully because it leverages the pre-trained model to do that. So if you look at the word error rate, because that's how you evaluate speech recognition and that's how you compare systems, at least that's, that's uh, an, an easy way to compare systems and, and to compare them also a, a long time ago. So, so you can see a, a very steady decrease of the rate, something that, that we've not seen. I mean, during 20 years, it was pretty steady. Okay, getting down a little, but pretty flat. And then, wow, since 2012, whew, going down. So, so it, it's actually moved even below the level that's supposed to be the Schumann level of uh, speech transcription. Of course, you always want to be careful when you were saying that uh, those systems are better than human. You want to, to keep in mind that those are very artificial tasks, right? Asking humans to listen to some recorded audio and, and trying to annotate it, label it, that's not a natural human activity, right? So of course you're comparing a very artificial task that, that you require human to do with another artificial task that you ask your artificial system to do. And so sometimes the artificial system is better at that kind of artificial task, right? But the, 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 uh, the bottom line is that it gets better than, the, the, than uh, some human benchmarks. Um, and then this, these are also the results on another benchmark called Libri speech. So that's read speech, uh, no uh, books, uh, audio books. Uh, and uh, you, you can also see this, uh, this trend of the word error rate getting down and actually lower than the human level. And what's interesting is that uh, since, um, uh, since 2020, uh, since the self-supervised model Wave2Vec2 was uh, published, uh, all the top performing systems have been using Wave2Vec2. So clearly, uh, it's the new state of the art. Here, uh, again, on this comparison between Schumann performance level and uh, system performance level on easy benchmarks, that is like red speech is easy more than spontaneous speech, or uh, the switchboard uh, corpus we, we saw. This is telephony speech, okay, but very intelligible between two uh, people with very good American accent in, in non-noisy environment. So those are pretty easy benchmarks, not, not the real thing you get in the industry that we'll see. Uh, but anyway, on those easy benchmarks, um, the, uh, the, uh, the systems have, have uh, consistently beaten the uh, Schumann uh, performances. So it's the, the getting very, very, the word error rate is getting really, really low. So this raises a question, what's the new frontier? I mean, if speech recognition is solved, well, next frontier is understanding. So most people that are uh, working in uh, speech, or that were, were working in spe on speech recognition are most of them uh, busy now working on spoken language understanding of that kind of tasks. So now I just want to take one step back because what we've seen here is actually two things. Okay, uh, we, we've, uh, we've reached very, very low word error rate. We've reached very high accuracy, um, but also uh, we reached that with the specific models, the self-supervised learning models that we can call foundation models because they're, um, they're really big and they're very generic. 
and you just build on top of them. Okay, you build your system on top of them. Uh, so if you look uh, since uh, at the, at the uh, research landscape since the deep learning revolution in uh, 2012. Um, so, so you see uh, Joshua Bengio, Geoff Hinton, and Yann Lequin here, on the bottom left corner. Uh, well, uh, this deep learning thing have been applied first to images, image processing, uh, character recognition, uh, or handwritten recognition, and writing recognition and uh, to speech recognition, but um, soon enough it's been used for natural language processing. And of course, I'm, I'm certain that you're all aware of that. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, NLP has like invented an architecture of its own called transformers, encoders, decoders, attention, whatever. And those transformers are, are really huge. And they've been then used also by the speech community and image community to, to build their own models. So that's what we so so we're gonna we're gonna look at this. Uh, this this was the first really the first foundation model that was published. This is uh, BERT in 2019. So the idea of BERT is to to take huge volume of raw text, no annotation, no label. You don't care. You just collect all the text you can get your hands on, and then you will learn from. Uh, self-supervised tasks. That is, you, you don't need label. Uh, what you will ask the system to do is, for instance, guess the next uh, a masked word. So you mask 15% of the words in your corpus, and then you turn, of course. Um, and you ask the system to, uh, to guess the masked word. And by doing so, the system learns a lot about how words are uh, tied together, how they behave, how they, uh, where they pop up, etc. Uh, and another self-supervised task is guessing the next sentence. Given a sentence, what, what, what is the, the next sentence that's most likely? Or uh, you, 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 you give sentence pairs and you ask the question, is it the next sentence? Does it make sense? Or is it not the next sentence? Okay. So it's a very simple self-supervised task. You don't need a label. And by, by training the model on these kind of tasks, you actually learn something about language, about language structure. And, and that's how you, pre, you, you do your pre-trained model, your very generic foundation model, quite huge, something like hundreds of millions of parameters for BERT. And then we, we hit a billion, hundreds of billions of parameters, so really, really huge things. Uh, and those pre-trained models are very uh, impressive, very efficient, for instance, on a set of um, language understanding tasks, again, very artificial task, okay? I'm not saying that those systems are better than human and at understanding human speech, but on these very precise tasks, uh, well, the system outperforms uh, average humans. Uh, so so it, is, it is actually impressive. Uh, and now with audio, we did the same. So you, you see again this wave to wave thing. It's doing exactly the same as Bert is trying to, to, to play the game. Okay, what is the mask sound? That's a bit more difficult because it's continuous. Sound is a continuous signal. It's not like words that have like a natural tokenization somehow. So you need first to, 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 uh, to tokenize, to kind of tokenize it, to kind of quantize it. But that's, that's what's, what's been done with wave to wave 2 And then you can play the game. Guess what sound was masked here? And that gives rise to, to, to very powerful self-supervised learning. And then you have some projects like the speech parent project that will give you all the tools that you can, you can use on top of it and, and derive a lot of uh, models for, for a lot of tasks on it. Uh, but after uh, BERT and wave to vec uh, you have a lot of other models that are generative, like GPT-3, T5, Lambda, Bloom. So all those, uh, do, those models, all those, uh, foundation models, they're able to generate a sequence of characters or words or code, even programming code, uh, given a, uh, an input. And so that's what's been uh, integrated in, in uh, GitHub Copilot for developers. And it's estimated today that, well, the, the estimations vary between 30% to 40% of the code that is actually uh, suggested by uh, GitHub Copilot and that the programmers don't have to write anymore, okay? Because the systems learns what kind of, uh, of, of lines of codes would naturally match here. 
And uh, actually, 30% of the time, 40% of the time, it's actually right. So, so you don't have to write it anymore. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, another thing that was impressive or actually like a scandal in the media was this uh, Google research engineers who was persuaded that uh, the um, dialogue system, uh, Google Lenda, was sentient and that he was actually interacting with a real person and that uh, we should recognize its right, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's also uh, um, like uh, put some light on this kind of uh, research. Uh, and now the big thing is those image foundation models like DALI2, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion that a lot of people are, are starting to play with and more than play with, actually using it for their work, for, uh, for uh, producing um, advertisement or uh, illustrations, paintings, whatever. And so those also are foundation models. And uh, look, it's a teddy bear. So, so, so I've, I've almost succeeded in doing a, a, a presentation on AI without talking about cats. But you see, there were a lot of cats in the beginning, right? <laughs> uh, OK, so now the race is the race to size. Because the bigger the model, the bigger this foundation models, the, the better they are. And as they can uh, be fed with huge volume of data, you, it's, it's almost unlimited because you don't have to label the data. And you know how costly it is to label data. But if you don't have to label data, well, you can get really huge volumes. So those models, they get more and more volumes and they got more and more parameters and they're they are getting enormous, like the Turing NLG model uh, is something like, uh, oh my God, um, in millions, it's 50, oh, it's 15 um, uh, billion, uh, so, oh, I think it's even more than that, uh, parameters. Uh, but well, you're in the billions. You're in the billions parameters. So, so, so it's it's pretty it's pretty large, and of course, it is costly in terms of energy. Okay, so we're all very aware of uh, the, we're all very concerned about the gas supply. Well, those models, when you train them, they they uh, they consume um, uh, more than uh, the, the all the energy that you consume in one average human life, or uh, uh, the uh, more than a U.S. car in all its lifetime uh, in terms of gas, etc. So, so that's that's very uh, uh, energy. Uh, it has it has very high consumption of energy. So the idea is that okay, those models are huge. They require huge energy, huge infrastructure. Not everyone has that kind of infrastructure. Not everyone can pay that kind of bill. I mean, it it costs. It it might cost millions to train one of those models. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's actually changing the landscape of, uh, of, the, of research and, and industry. So on the one hand, you will have all the big guys, so Google, Meta, OpenAI, uh, with uh, Microsoft financing, um, NVIDIA. So those guys are building the definition models. They have the infrastructure, they have the data, they have the, they pay the bill. <laughs> Uh, okay, so they, they produce those models and then they uh, most are then given out for, for being used, some for free, some not for free, like GPT-3. Then you have specialist platform like Hugging Face, OVH, that are able to run those models or host the fine tuning of those models to your tasks. And then, okay, so cloud, okay, companies, startups, they can then just uh, create the fine tune models. And the good, good news for, for uh, uh, our community, or for the NLP community, is that uh, you can actually um, focus on labeling a very a small data set or small, small volume data set. That's OK if you have a small volume data set, but it's very well targeted. It's very well labeled. It will, it will, have you, uh, it will produce for you good fine-tuned models if you just fine-tune one of those gigantic pre-trained foundation models, right? So that's pretty good news. But what about the data that you have? Where, where, where will it go? Where do you train the model? Where the data flows? Um, how do you run the model? Who, who are you dependent from? Uh, what do you inherit? I mean, if, if all the world is using the same pre-trained model, if all um, uh, hiring systems, if all uh, credit scoring systems, et cetera, or whatever, um, are using the same pre-trained model, 
wow, that's, that's a bit dangerous because they, they will have the same bias. And so wherever you go, you will just anchor the same bias. You won't even have the chance to have some diversity in bias, which is what happens for us humans. We have bias, but we're diverse. We don't all have the same, or hopefully not. Um, but those pre-trained models, they're a bit dangerous if they're just you know, ruling the world and uh, the same models serves for every application. So good news is there are now some alternatives coming up. So typically you have some research, researchers, organizations in uh, public institutions uh, concerned about being able to building their own foundation models to, to bring some diversity, to, to bring something else to the uh, foundation models uh, of, the, of the big guys. Of course, it requires a lot of infrastructure and a lot of data collection, but uh, some uh, academics are quite good at it. Um, and then you also have players uh, in, in Europe or in other countries, uh, in each country, uh, which uh, want to, to stay expert, which want to stay sovereign, and that will try to do their own or tweak the pre-trained model and not choose them as is and use their own infrastructure. Same thing for some companies who value on-prem or very private deployment and training who, who don't want the data to, to get out of their, of their premises, like banks, insurers, these guys, uh, they're, they're very concerned about where the data goes. And of course, you also have GDPR in Europe. That's, that's also something that companies have to take into account. So, so that's kind of the good news. It's, uh, so the, the landscape has not been totally um, say reversed uh, or, or to totally aligned towards uh, big guys foundations on the one side, small financial models on the other side. It's it's still you know uh, uh, trying to to find its positions, but um, it's it's interesting times. Okay, <laughs> and all those questions are very uh, now more more and more important questions for all the companies, all the applications that you're deploying. Uh, all those questions about data, about sovereignty, about uh, dependence uh, are, are now becoming very, uh, very important. Okay, so now back to business. I promised some stories from the industry world, right? So it's, it's about time to, to, to get to that. Um, I'll start with two kind of niche uh, applications, two niche industries. Uh, I've had the pleasure to, uh, to um, encounter during my career. So one is indexing and searching in news. And, and um, it's a niche industry market, but it's something that's very well covered in the uh, academic research because the good thing about um, processing news, uh, TV news, radio news, uh, uh, social media uh, contents, etc., or doing video contents, which are actually exploding, is that uh, it's great corpora. You have massive data, you have naturally labeled data because some of the data are all, already subtitles. Then you also have text corpora that are very relevant uh, for, for your training and that are very close in vocabulary to, to, your, uh, to your speech or, or video. So, so this, is, this is pretty nice uh, playground for academics. So, so, so research teams have been working on this subject for, for many years now. So it's a kind of a technology push once the research teams had this model ready and saying, hey, hey I've got uh, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Industry uh, players. I, I got a great thing. I, I'm able to, to transcribe radio. I'm able to transcribe TV. I'm able to transcribe YouTube, video, etc. cetera. Um, just use it. Of course, it's not that easy. Um, Okay, it's, it's great to have a lot of data. It's, it's, uh, it's great also to work on mostly open source or, or public data that you, that you don't have all this privacy and, uh, and confidentiality of data problems. Um, it's great to, to have still some tech challenge, okay? Because it's not that easy. You still have new words popping up every day. So even if you have great corpora, uh, it's never finished, right? Work is never finished. Uh, but even this can be can be uh, accommodated with uh, with some automated uh, monitoring system. Uh, but then you have to look at the business benefit, and so the business benefit is not that easy to find. So a few companies have been able to find it, 
but they really had to look hard. Okay, how can I um, lower my cost in terms of monitoring? So I'm a media monitoring company. I have people listening to audio, uh, looking at uh, at news. Uh, maybe I can I can alleviate their their work with this automated system. But believe me, it was not that easy to find the right way to alleviate their work. It's it's really complex human AI collaboration. Um, and then, uh, so that's really the adoption key was in this collaboration. Uh, another niche market was trading floors. Uh, okay, so this time it was not technology push, it was really the banks or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the corporate banks co coming to uh, tech players saying, oh, uh, I have a new uh, regulatory uh, compliance obligations. I need to, uh, to, to monitor what the traders are saying all the time in their phone. Uh, help me do that, because it's very difficult uh, case actually for speech recognition. You have all the difficult stuff, multilingual accents, noise, bad audio quality, etc. So, so this was very interesting, but still, it's 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 a niche market. And now, the big market or one of the big biggest markets for speech uh, tech and lang tech is contact centers, because that's the market where it's all based on communication, on uh, speech and language, on dialogues. So that's the big thing. And actually there's a big gap. It's like a paradox. And how come you, you interact so easily with your smart speaker or your voice assistant, play my lofty hip hop or playlist from Spotify, whatever. And then when you call a connect center, well, more, more uh, quite often you will have a press to do this, press one, to do that, press two. Wow, how come, why this gap? Uh, especially since people are actually annoyed by those phone menus. Okay, so the gap is actually now getting, uh, well, closing a bit. So uh, more and more uh, big guys, uh, or, I mean, big companies are uh, deploying what we call natural language qualification. Um, Problem fracture. Okay, that's how people might interact with the system. Changement d'adresse pour la Buig et installation uh, B-Box. So it's in French, but the, the first one said invoice issue. The second one said address change for the Buig, uh, B-Box. Gérer mon forfait. Okay, then you have other examples here. Je veux assurer mon véhicule de remplacement. Now you're starting to have more natural. Et je veux savoir si le dernier document que j'ai envoyé a été enregistré. Euh, je vous appelle pour euh, au sujet de mon contrat parce que je voulais, je voulais prendre une nouvelle option. Okay, so this one has even some accents and it's very spontaneous with some disfluency. So now it's starting to get to getting interested. Interesting. So those systems quite uh, work quite well, uh, and they bring real real uh, return on investment for large for massive contact centers, not for small sized ones, but for large sized contact centers, very organized contact centers, it does bring value. Um, and the main problem for these systems, as I, I told you, that speech recognition is almost solved is mainly on the NLU, natural language understanding, and the dialogue design. So that's the next big thing. Uh, same thing with the callbots. Callbots is mainly about dialogue. Uh, and I mean, multi-turn dialogue. So that's um, the, uh, the, the, ma the main uh, issue with callbots. So here I just show you a few, uh, very, very rapidly a few uh, screenshots of the kind of systems we're using, the kind of environment we're using to design those voice assistant to design those voice bots and how we monitor the, the corpora of annotated um, sentences with intent, with uh, NLU intent and how we design the dialogue. But the, the main challenge is now is how do you scale that up? Uh, okay, a, a lot of things here are handcrafted. Um, how do you, how can you generalize? Uh, how can you uh, leverage all those nice stuff that we saw that foundation models are bringing to you? Uh, excellent capabilities in speech understanding or language understanding, excellent capacity in generating language. How can you leverage that to help with your dialogues? That's not solved at all at, all at the moment. Um, and also, I, lo I love this one. What is automated our golden standard? Should you try to, to mimic humans or should you, should you take another standard and then which one? And what about emotion? That's the next big thing. Um, I think I don't have the time to play this thing, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and, and I encourage you to, uh, to go and check it out. This is Google Duplex uh, that uh, once stumbled on an, a voice bot called Poly AI. 
and both talk together. And uh, it's pretty fun to hear. They. <laughs> we have now reopened. I'm a digital host. I can make bookings or tell you what. Oh, yeah. Cannot go. But anyway, um, so so in the end, uh, Google Duplex uh, got something, uh, but not exactly what what you'd think uh, it would be. Yeah, can you hear it? No, but uh, but it's interesting, and they, they they kind of converged. They kind of got each each one got approximately what uh, it reached its targets, but in the end, Google Duplex actually got something wrong. And it was it was not uh, it was not possible to 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 truly correct it. So so it's really a, a question: How do you manage uh, this kind of dialogue? Because it's not just speech; it's spoken language. And spoken language is very complex. I really love this slide. I I put it like as is from Roger Moore, Speech One Hundred and One. I also encourage you. This everyone should should look at this. At this uh, you you get you get all the slides. You get the video. It's it's lovely really enjoyable, uh, and you learn a lot of things uh, about uh, spoken language uh, and and all the, the wealth of spoken language and, and the difficulty and the mystery also of spoken language. And these ones, uh, just a few, a few books uh, I, I really love uh, about um, uh, the, the art of conversation. What should be your golden standard? Should you mimic humans? Should you not? That's a real question. People are actually kind of fighting on this, on this topic. Um, I won't have the time to talk about augmented supervision, but you, you, you certainly understand that uh, being able to help agents and supervisors in real time while they're having the conversation is something that's like the holy grail in contact centers. Um, and a lot is, is expected from that. It's just that no one really knows how to achieve that, right? <laughs> because this is totally new ways to have AI and human collaborate. And so this needs to be invented. Um, so the challenges are this collaboration. What are the universals? Uh, how how you can, you, can you universally help uh, agents or supervisor? What are the right and wrong paths? So typically a wrong path. I just, I think I'll finish that uh, with that. Um, for example, you could use pop-up, okay? So you have your agent on the call, you have your great systems, it's listening in the same time, it's understanding what's going on. And wow, it's popping up a few suggestions to, to the agent. Hey, here, you should say that. Whoa, terrible. Why? Because while the agent is reading the pop-up, his brains can't do any talking or listening anymore because, that's for how we are built, we human beings. We just have one language center. We cannot do several language tasks at the same time. So, so it's absolutely terrible because uh, the, you're just adding a language task to the agent and it's not listening and not, not talking at, at that time. So it's the, the right way is not doing that. The right way is being invisible. The right way is, uh, on the contrary, making things invisible for, for the agent. Just the, 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 the apps opens up magically the fields fills fill up magically and the agent doesn't have to type anymore or to uh, to to search or look up for applications anymore but that's a tricky thing in terms of integration okay so i think we're done now uh just as a summary um okay so you've understood that recent neural models and especially those foundations models self-supervised learning models they've helped a lot, they help a lot with accuracy, with robustness, with generalization, they help with time to market, they help with low resource issues, they help with multilinguality, a lot of models are multilingual today. Um, and they're pushing a lot of tasks closer to maturity. But what they're not solved yet is all those infra and data, privacy, sovereignty, et cetera, choices. That's like new challenges. Uh, you also have a lot of, of challenges with scalability, industrialization, uh, privacy, ethics, uh, and all the things that are closer to maturity, like affective computing, detecting emotions, uh, monitoring emotions, uh, that's really new. And so it's not yet mature, uh, though we, we, we can try we are, uh, using them already somehow. And then dialogue management, speech communication, the conversational challenge. There are a few further readings uh, that, that you can check. And I want to, to end with one of those slides I love from Roger Moore. Uh, well, finally, speech is just the most sophisticated behavior of the most complex organism in the non-universe. And welcome to it. <laughs>
I don't think probably. Yeah. Thanks a lot for a very interesting speech. And uh, are there questions? I have a lot. <laughs> Rian, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, my question would be, what's going on in the area where you don't have one person speaking, but it's a dialogue, uh, comes from monochannel, uh, diarization, this complex uh, scenarios when there's a lot of noise, maybe a conference where there's a panel and multiple people are speaking. How is this area moving along? Maybe a, in, in a minute. Yeah, okay. Very good questions. It's true that uh, a lot of data today, recordings are monochannel. So you have uh, the, uh, the the agent and customer side or the two, the two speakers on the same channel so so there is like uh, um, overlapped speech etc that's that's really a challenge in terms of diarization so the task of separating the different speakers on one channel i've seen really impressive uh, progress again with self-supervised learning with with uh, foundation models I, I i'm amazed i'm amazed i mean i've been uh, working with teams with R&D teams on speech diarization, for quite some time. And of course we were doing progress, steady progress, moving from statistical to deep uh, neural network diarization yeah, it was it was steady, steadily progressing. But what I've seen this year, it's wow. I mean, the system is, is uh, even able to, to detect overlap speech saying, oh, Speaker one is speaking from this time to that time, and speaker two starts here and ends here. So it, it, it really is able to detect the, the part that's overlapped and, we, and who is talking during the overlap. So this is very, very impressive. Of course, it's very uh, costly. Okay, so for, for the moment, for instance, uh, I, I've not asked the team to, to deploy it on our, on our infrastructure because it would like cost uh, like five times the cost just to transcribe speech. So, okay, so, so you still have some industrial, industrialization questions to, to, to settle, but uh, the, the, the power of the self-supervised learning is, uh, uh, models is, is here. So thanks for the question. Ariana, uh, thanks again also from me from your excellent uh, lecture. And I had a question about one of your last uh, topics and that's about the emotion. Can you go a, a little bit deeper in what you believe is the best way to solve that problem? Because you, you have your language and well, in the past you could say that people from one language had more or less the same cultural background and, and, and way of speaking, but due to the international internationalization of people, we have, at, at least in the Netherlands, a lot of people from different backgrounds and that's causing also in real life problem. I'm absolutely curious to hear from you what you believe is the best way to solve this problem using emotion in speech. Okay, Th thank you, Ariane. So, so your your question is really on the uh, on the variability or the uh, uh, between between people and whether one way of speaking might be uh, considered as. Uh, anger for some people and might be considered as joy for others or, or neutral even for others. Yeah, okay, very good questions. Um, you're right, uh, at the moment, uh, emotion detection is not totally ready for prime time, okay? So you can do some stuff. Uh, it's way better than before. I mean, I remember like even like two years ago, engineers were happy when saying, oh, I'm better than random. Wow, <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, so we, we're past that. <laughs> we're, we're more, clo we're closer to, uh, okay, I'm 80%, I agree, but 80% is not enough, okay? It means that 20% of the time, you might be, uh, you know, um, uh, thinking that the, the, the person is angry and, she's, and actually she's not. So, so it's still a problem. So um, I think there are probably two or three answers to that. So first one is, you, you know how, how much I'm impressed at the moment with uh, self-supervised models and foundation models. And it's true that they, they, they really contribute to this kind of uh, issues. 
And so the nice thing about foundation models is that uh, you can fine tune them on small data, data sets, but very well chosen, very well labeled data sets. So one of the answer is, well, we need more labeling. And maybe that's that's the kind of effort that, that might be also a collective effort also from the research community, trying to, to define uh, a labeling uh, standard. Um, oh, and actually, uh, we'll be announcing uh, very uh, very soon uh, the uh, the open sourcing of a uh, of a platform of a toolkit a Python toolkit to uh, to annotate emotion in speech. Okay, that's that's a, a joint effort between Vadalag and the uh, and the Grenoble University. So we developed that, and we thought, well, it's not it's not our core business, so why not open source it? Uh, so, so it, it will be announced very soon. So, yeah, why not use that kind of tools? Why not the, the academic uh, community uh, agree also on, on standards? And, okay, with, with small data set, very well labeled, maybe we can make differences. And just like you said, maybe try to, uh, to have some uh, specific data set for different kinds of uh, cultural origins of regions, uh, uh, education, uh, educational background. So that's that's one of the answer. Fine tuning on well labeled data, even small data, data set. Another answer is knowledge fusion. So here on the slide, what you see is we are trying to uh, to compare what the uh, language sentiment analysis tells and what the emotion detection tells. And sometimes they're 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 in line. They are kind of reinforced uh, one another. Okay, you say, uh, alors vous voulez dire que vous avez aucun type de forfait à me proposer? So, so you don't have any uh, package to, to offer to me? So the person is angry. And, and the language is, is clearly non-ambiguously angry as well. So, so in that kind of cases, you would say, well, if I have sentiment analysis and emotion detection that agree, well, maybe I get something, right? Then you have other cases where, well, maybe it's neutral and, and only sentiment analysis is telling something. And sometimes it's in conflict. Of course, that's interesting stuff. Uh, as of today, maybe emotion detection uh, is not really, um, uh, say, uh, accurate enough. So you can be sure, 100% sure that you have a real conflict. And this is irony. So here is, um, alors là, bravo, hein, super bien joué. Hein? Okay, so the person is angry. Oh, right, great. You did, you, good, good job, really. Good job, man. So uh, the person is angry here, uh, but if you just look at the words, well, they look great. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's, this is analyzed as an excellent uh, review, right? Okay, so in this case, it's interesting. It's a real conflict. This is real irony. But in other cases, maybe it's just that you're wrong, right? <laughs> that the person is not angry. She's really happy about the service. So, so we need to do to do some some progress. But the interesting thing is that when the two systems agree, okay, so you have uh, alignment between what uh, the the language tells you and what the the speech emotion seem to tell you. Well, at least you can base your system on that. And that's a start. We have time for a, a question about the short answer. So, uh, so I have uh, a similar question. So our societies are based on a written word um, since ever. Something which is written has more value than something which is uh, spoken. Um, do you know something about the studies concerning the impact of uh, the written word uh, that was transcripted. Um, okay, so it is, is the question about uh, like legal issue, uh, whether a transcription- No, it's not about legal issues. It's about uh, the, the value. It, if I read something, not if we read something, then we, we assign more value uh -huh. to the written word than to the spoken word. That's very interesting. Uh, but do you know some studies about this? Okay, so honestly, I had never thought about this, but now that you mention it, I think it's extremely interesting. Why? Uh, we've been uh, trying to, to deploy speech analytics or deploying speech analytics or so-called speech analytics system at contact centers. So speech analytics is basically the idea that after the, the, the calls have, have ended, after uh, uh, you, you're trying to extract some knowledge, some uh, evaluation from the uh, from those uh, conversa recorded conversations and mostly from the transcripts of those conversations, okay? Um, okay. 
Now, what you're saying make me think of something. Might the um, supervisors, might the, uh, the contact center um, or the director or the uh, customer or well, the head of customer relationship person actually be more impressed by the fact that it's been transcribed and that he can see, you know, black and white, that the customer said, I'm not happy at all with the service or something like that. Whereas it would not have paid so much attention to some recording somewhere, right? So, so your question is interesting, and and maybe that's a, that's some study we could do. I I do not have figures on that, but that's actually uh, interesting to study, really. Okay, thank you, and uh, you will be here, so we can uh, give give you our que extra questions later on. So, thank you, the invited speaker. Thank you.